In July 2006, Catholic Health Initiatives celebrated its 10th anniversary. At this milestone, it's a good time to look back, to hear the story of CHI's beginning from three of the pioneers who helped create the system and shape its spirit of innovation and legacy of care. In the time-honored tradition of the storyteller, we turn to sisters Mariana Coyle and Esther Anderson, both members of the Steering Council that created CHI and former chairpersons of the CHI Board, and to Pat Cahill, the first president and CEO. They tell us the story of how Catholic Health Initiatives was created to bring the healing ministry of Christ into the 21st century. The story begins with three, then four, courageous health systems. Catholic Health Corporation, Franciscan Health System, Sisters of Charity Healthcare Systems, and Sisters of Charity of Nazareth Health System. It was the vision of these four systems to join together with the goal of redefining the future of Catholic health care in the United States. As I reflect upon where we are today with Catholic Health Initiatives, which has often been referred to as the Great Experiment, I realize that the seeds that have moved us into this new model really were sown in the very core and identity of our individual religious congregations. And I think that we recognized as time went on and the complexity of healthcare grew, that we needed to engage the laity more actively mm -hmm and the governance of our organizations. But I think we always saw the laypersons as collaborative. And what helped me with the proposal about Catholic health initiatives was that we would bring our laypersons into full partnership and that that partnership would be recognized by the church. I think also it was the external voices we were hearing that we were responding to. You know, there were voices that saying, the Catholic Health Ministry is not going to survive mm -hmm. without collaboration. Mm -hmm. The impact of the for-profit industry on taking over community hospitals was very threatening mm -hmm. to our standalone institutions. There was a call to look at new models of sponsorship. So in a sense, the pathway was being laid out, but very few were willing to follow it. Mm -hmm. Well, And you think about um, how often all of us heard in those late 80s, mm -hmm. early 90s days, if only the Catholics could get their act right. together, they mm -hmm. would be a mighty force in health care. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it took a long time. It and really did. I know when I first met some of the presentations with our congregational leadership, they were really concerned that we were getting into big business and that we would lose the dimension of ministry and personalism that was important to them at the local facility level. Mm -hmm. And I do think we were the pioneer as far as turning over the sponsorship totally mm -hmm. to, to the them. Board of Stewardship Trustees, whereas in many of the other structures there were certain reserve powers still maintained mm -hmm. either by the congregation or by the public juridic person separate from the board. Mm -hmm. In our being willing to create this new organization, we were not only challenging ourselves but challenging others to look at their own survival and to what we really need to do collaboratively for the good of the ministry because that's what we hold in common mm -hmm. is the healing ministry. Uh, at that time there were four of the Catholic health care systems mm -hmm. that came together in a very tentative meeting in the summer of, I think it was 94. It was, and the Daughters of Charity the, initiated it. Yeah, but at the end of the conversation, even facilitated two of them couldn't quite make the leap at that point in time, which left Catholic Health Corporation and the Sisters of Charity um, Healthcare System in Cincinnati at the table looking at one another saying, but we're going to do this. And I think one of the things that really helped it move forward was the fact that the three CEOs, Diane Moeller, Sister Celestia, and Ron, had worked together on a number of initiatives. So there was a basic trust and a compatibility that helped move the process in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. And then once we decided to go, we thought, well, how do we get from step one to the, where we want to go? And uh, I think the formation of a steering council was really a brilliant move. And I can recall us arriving at the Skybird, which was the location of choice, uh, at Chicago Airport uh, for this first meeting, wondering how are we going to get this thing off the ground? And where does one begin? 
But one of the brilliant moves I felt was made uh, at our first meeting was to engage uh, Carl oh. Hitchner, and we all have very happy memories of Carl as a facilitator. He was such a gift. And then uh, we c began to refer to the Carl Hitchner principles. He had met with the three CEOs and had drafted a framework or a blueprint, uh, 19 issues uh, phased in questions that we needed to address to really have this uh, reality come into fruition. I think there were two absolutely brilliant conclusions. Mm -hmm. And the first was, we are going to do this, and we are therefore going to do very minimal due diligence on any of the parts of the organization. So as one of the lawyers said, who was part of this activity, he said, we did due diligence as if we were already a family. Mm -hmm. The second brilliant move, I think, was when you said to everyone, you're in, you cannot get out. You cannot take your facilities out. And if you remember the history of mergers in the late 80s and 90s in healthcare in this country, people came together, giant organizations came together and then fell apart because of disagreements four or five years into it. And we did have our moments with religious congregations mm -hmm. that weren't quite happy with how things were going mm -hmm. or facilities that complained about the national office wasn't dealing with them mm -hmm. fairly but they couldn't escape. And one of the realities of not being able to escape is that you stay to solve the problems and you find solutions to your problems. So that CHI came together, it has never unraveled, and it remains a very healthy organization today. The work needed to bring Catholic health initiatives from concept to reality was a multi-layered process of successes and challenges. Most of all, it was an example of how dedicated and unselfish individuals can put aside personal objectives to support the success of a revolutionary idea. I think for a lot of people who may not be familiar with the term public juridic person, it's helpful to clarify that within canon or church law, a public juridic person is the same as a corporation is in civil law. It essentially is, gives you an identity that the law can deal with. It really is nothing more than a corporation in church terms. And we forget sometimes that the public juridic person model took 12 years to reach conclusion in its mm -hmm. first iteration from when the Catholic Health Corporation brought it into uh, potential, it took 12 years to 1991 before mm -hmm. the Vatican approved it. It was an enormous length mm -hmm. of time. And the second one through went through mm -hmm. very, very quickly. It was you know, groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. It was a new model and it came to be in 91 and thereafter it was seen as this is a very important next mm -hmm. step. Catholic Health Initiatives officially began with a formal ritual held on July 1st, 1996. Another ritual that really touched me was uh, when the initiation of Catholic Health Initiatives in that July 1996. Yes. We had one very a tall candle and there were three tapers lit from each one of the systems and the uh, system representative lit the candle, of the larger candle, and then blew out their tapers. And that was a symbol of the letting go mm -hmm. of the individual system mm -hmm. and the creation of Catholic Health Initiatives. I think the ritual itself was so impactful because of the fact that it occurred in four different time zones simultaneously. Mm -hmm. All of the people belonging to Catholic Health Initiatives organizations participated in a prayer experience and a video and a commissioning now as partners which you gave to them in the leadership mm -hmm. of Catholic Health right. Initiatives. Yeah. It was a very special day. Mm -hmm. It really was. And, and one of the results of that day was that everyone received a bookmark. And this bookmark is a blessing that reminds them that they are blessed because of their calling to carry forward the vision, the mission and the vision of Catholic Health Initiatives, and to be faithful to the healing ministry of the Church. The same spirit and vision that brought the 12 congregations of women religious together also united the Board of Stewardship Trustees. 
In the unique CHI model, the board is charged with both governance and sponsorship. This dual role means that the trustees are responsible not only for governing the organization, but also for nurturing this healing ministry. One of the areas that the steering council was very concerned about was the definition of the role and the composition of the Board of Stewardship Trustees. Mm -hmm. In looking at the role, we recognized the fact that it was very important that these potential trustees would really have a clear understanding of our vision and mission, and that they would be committed to it and to the broader concept of our expression of our health care ministry. It was very clear that even though we had people from the various systems, they were not there representing their former systems or the religious congregations. They really were looking at Catholic health initiatives and what was the best decision to make for the whole. And they were an astounding group of people. They were. And we were really creating our own path. What did it mean to be both governance and sponsor in the same role? And we were very cognizant of our responsibility to the Catholic Church for this ministry. And I think it became so evident in the commissioning services. When I look at the particular uh, experience of the commissioning ritual, I think that was the first time in which the board itself felt the weight of responsibility of being both a civil corporation and a public juridic person or a church corporation. Mm -hmm. And the very setting of that ritual, which was at Holy Ghost Church, was one in which we came together. We came together as people who believed in the mission. And so I saw that ritual as a very transformational one for us as religious congregations, because we were saying, please come with us as a partner mm -hmm. in this enterprise. Be a partner and creator with us in moving forward a new vision. The question now became how best to frame this new vision. Initially, it was decided to keep a regional structure in place. The regions were still in place mm -hmm. because there had to be some structure for an organization of our size. And yet once we got started with the regions, it became very apparent that the regions were a, an organizational difficulty. They were not enhancing what right. we were doing. And we went through several iterations till we found the right iteration. But early on, each region was building its own its own kingdom. kingdom. And then there was duplication of services across the country. We had um, in, inappropriate and um, unbalanced distribution of mm -hmm. resources. And most important, they were between the national office and the market-based organization. So we couldn't see through to the market-based organization and really know what was going on inside. Had not the regions uh, stayed in place, for at least a period of time, we would have had oh, a vacuum chaos. that you would have been mm -hmm. floundering in. That's correct. I think it would have been chaos, but it became very clear early on that there was problem attached to the structure. And so as we evolved, we finally became a national office and individual market-based organizations so that we could see them, they could see us, and we could understand mm -hmm. what was going on between yeah. us. And I think those, that was a very important move forward for us. To me, the other challenges of the Steering Council were related to the location of Catholic Health Initiatives and the selection of the CEO. We had the stipulation that the location would be in either a mountain or a central zone. Right and it would not be in any place where there was an existing system office. When we really came down to the five, it was Memphis, Minneapolis, St. Louis, and then mm -hmm. Denver and Chicago, and we came to the two, Chicago and Denver. We really saw Denver uh, in the light of our former sisters who had moved out into the frontiers mm -hmm. as a frontier type of city that would continue to grow. And so uh, we saw in that light that it, it sent a message that we were about something new, that we were creating a frontier. I was in New York at the time, and I th said, they said, well, we want it to be in an exciting new city. And I said, well, Broadway is exciting. 
<laughs> and I was told, well, not exciting enough. So when I came, we finally got our office location. Mm -hmm. um, its address was 1999 Broadway, so I did the very best I as could. As close as you could the come. very best I could. And so I looked for the office first. And as I was going over to 1999 Broadway to look at that building, one of the young men who was taking us around the city said, you might not want to go to this building. There's a church downstairs, and they feed the hungry at noontime. And I can remember thinking, Mission Holy in Spirit <laughs> is right here. This must be the building. And it turned out to be the perfect mm -hmm. spot for us. And Pat, as the CEO, we finally selected. We recognized that you were just like our pioneer sisters, moving from the skyscrapers of New York to the mountains of Colorado. Colorado. But in identifying a CEO, again, we were sometimes criticized for the very idealistic, well, even God couldn't do this approach. Because we use such terms in our job description as, as catalyst, uh, change agent, uh, convener, communicator. And what we were looking for was someone who understood the vision and would not have been perhaps shackled by the traditional CEO model job description. Mm -hmm. Because we recognized that in the creation of Catholic Health Initiatives, the challenges, which were many, were going to require someone who could keep that global focus. And that was very important in the selection. It was so important that we draw the right people mm -hmm. to CHI. People who were certainly competent in their respective fields, and we certainly found that, but who were committed to and excited about mm -hmm. the vision. And we were very, very blessed mm -hmm. in our early choices of um, national staff and for many of the MBO mm -hmm. CEOs yes. as well. I always understood that I had three marching orders from the steering council, and they were very specifically, you will establish a mission and ministry mm -hmm. fund. There will be something that we put aside, take money from the facilities, save it till we have $100 million, and we will distribute that for charitable purposes in perpetuity. And that's what we aimed at. That's what we did. We, we finally got that $100 million this past year. That was a very important initiative, and I understood mm -hmm. that was an order. The second was you will work to build healthy communities in the hospital towns. Mm -hmm. And we have worked very hard to make mm -hmm. that a reality of Catholic Health Initiatives. And the last was the giant description of advocacy. And traditionally, I think, in healthcare, Catholic healthcare, people tend to think about advocacy in political action mm -hmm. terms, and we certainly do too. But for Catholic Health Initiatives, advocacy has been looking for the right benefit programs for our employees, mm -hmm. investing our money in socially acceptable um, investments, mm -hmm. acting on our investments with companies that we do business with. So we've tried to see advocacy in a very broad context. And I think that has really, those three things, I think have set CHI mm -hmm. um, above and uh, to the one side of many of uh, the other he uh, healthcare systems, including Catholic healthcare systems, and I think is very indicative of the vision that the steering council had. In looking at the direction of our Board of Stewardship Trustees, one of the mandates of the steering council was that we would grow the organization. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you would believe it, waiting in the wings and eager to join us was the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth system in Kentucky. And then we had a smaller congregation, but a equally vital congregation in North Dakota, in Hankinson, mm -hmm. the Sisters of St. Francis, who also uh, learned about CHI. One of our goals was to grow the system and to add another system in the year. And I remember people challenging that as a very uh, large, a goal to have in mind, and yet we really did accomplish it. it. Mariana, when we talk about CHI getting started as an organization, you're always particularly focused on the importance of the core values and the process that brought those values into being um, when you discuss mm -hmm. our initial days. What was amazing to me was the fact that over 600 people throughout the organization participated in the process. The majority of participants had selected respect, respect and excellence and compassion and integrity. And I sat there and thought, oh, I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into the core because 
I think there's a deeper level that we want to identify than respect. I owe you respect as a person. But I look at a deeper level and I see that as I reverence you. I reverence you as a, as a creature of God. I reverence you just as the Native Americans reverence all of creation. And so I kind of pleaded that we would consider reverence instead of respect. That's one situation where I did win. I think those core values of reverence, integrity, compassion, and excellence have been really key um, factors in shaping our culture, you know, and the whole cultural competency and what we've accomplished in the 10 years mm -hmm. has been derived from those 10. So the process mm -hmm. really worked. You know, when we talk about Catholic Health Initiatives in its early days, um, I think we, we focus on all of the accomplishments, and there were mm -hmm. enormous accomplishments. That's right. Lots of programs and initiatives started, but we also had our challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can go through those challenges. Um, they sort of come in, in groups, if you will, and we can talk about them a bit. Um, certainly there was the multiple constituencies. Mm -hmm. We had the congregations who weren't always happy. We had the bishops who weren't always <laughs> happy. We had the joint operating agreements in which we had an enormous investment of billions of dollars, and they weren't always happy or easy. We were so engaged in forming CHI that we may have missed some steps in communication processes. So I think the first leadership conference, we had to do some catch up in terms of involving local boards and local CEOs more in the matters that pertain to them. Truthfully, I would say that for almost all of our troubled times um, with other organizations or constituencies, the difficulty really was communication. And unless you came up and hit us in the face, we sort of left you to one side. And so there were constituencies not happy for a couple of years before they verbalized their lack of content with us. So when we finally turned and looked at them and understood that we hadn't communicated effectively, whether that was the congregations, whether that was the boards of directors, or whether that was our JOA partners, um, once we began the communication process and improved things, a lot of those difficulties dissipated and went away. The one uh, problem that we always think about when we think about our early challenges is the financial difficulty we encountered in 99, 2000. And we did encounter a serious problem. I mean, that is not a career-enhancing move to tell a board that you're $100 million off budget. I can remember the board members saying, OK, there was no weeping and gnashing of teeth. There was no hysteria. They all said, OK, now. What's the plan? And we put together an action plan. The board supported it. We reported regularly on it. And we turned an enormous corner. We weathered the storm. We came out the other side. I'm a little grayer as a result of that experience. However, we did solve the problem. In its first decade, Catholic Health Initiatives experienced growing pains as its leaders struggled to create a viable national organization. The management really implemented some very difficult decisions that the board made. I remember like when we transitioned the five facilities mm -hmm. in the East Coast into Catholic Health East, even though it was another Catholic facility, some of the entities were through uh, going to their third sponsor um, and system in a very short time. Mm -hmm. The transitions were very difficult. We've, you know, certainly had Albuquerque and the five in the East. But in my seven and a half years, we transitioned 11 facilities out of mm -hmm. CHI. It was a very painful time. Well, I think what made it difficult is people really bought into the vision and the mission of yes. CHI and invested themselves That's totally right. in it. That's right. And then in a very short period of time, they were no longer part, part so to speak, of the family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was painful. Perhaps one of our hardest was we closed the last, or sold, the last Catholic hospital in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. I think that was an example of where we spent almost two years in dialogue with the local board mm -hmm. in making the decision. You recall our meeting with the Archbishop of Santa Fe mm -hmm. I do, and how distraught he was at the fact that we were not able to continue that ministry. But what I see as a redeeming factor, certainly for the people of Albuquerque, is we set up the St. Joseph mm -hmm. Community Health Services. Right. And in that doing so, we guaranteed a presence in Albuquerque but we also are focusing on healthy communities and on preventative health. 
And I think that in itself is modeling a new way of being in ministry without having the institutional structure. As Catholic Health Initiatives matures as a national health system, everyone is dedicated to living the legacy of the foundresses and to advancing Catholic health care. Follow me where I go, what I do and who I know. Uh, one of the rich gifts of our Catholic heritage is ritualization. And I really believe that that helped us tremendously in this process of change in Catholic health initiatives. And one ritual that particularly touched me and we performed every December was the ritual of alienation, which is a church term for the transfer of assets, in this case from the religious congregations to Catholic health initiatives. And what was particularly touching for me too was some of the symbols that the congregation mm -hmm. shared with us as a group that really uh, personified what they were about in the process. And each congregation had its own individual symbol. I remember the uh, Sisters of Great Bend, Kansas, provided us a cross that was made from Kansas wheat. Mm -hmm. And it was a symbol of their rural roots in Kansas. The um, Presentation Sisters gave us a lantern that was a symbol of Nano Nagel mm -hmm. in Ireland. Right. Her um, passion in walking the streets of Ireland in the night with this, can this is lantern mm -hmm. lit by a candle, seeking out ways of helping the poor. And for the uh, mercies, we have in front of us a comfortable cup of tea. Right. And that was one of the symbols that they gave to Catholic Health Initiatives, which was a mandate of their foundress, Catherine McCauley. We tend to forget the enormous financial wealth in those assets. When Catholic Health Initiatives came together, 10 congregations of women religious merged with a signing of the paper, $5 billion in assets. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if that isn't a leap of faith, I'm not certain what is. So I think they were looking at these and handing them off and very aware of what a momentous occasion it was. The ritualization itself was so significant because we as religious congregations were turning over to Catholic Health Initiatives enormous assets that had been stewarded over 100 years by these individual congregations. Mm -hmm. So it was a sign of relinquishment. And it did bring tears to mm -hmm. our eyes because it, it was a heartfelt moment of response to call and of the ongoing generosity of religious congregations to keep always in front of them the ministry as a primary reason for being. And our mm -hmm. common ground was not whether we were Mercy or Dominican mm -hmm. or Franciscan or Charity. It was because we were gospel women called to witness to the healing ministry of Christ. Over the years, CHI's religious and lay leaders made pilgrimages to Rome and the Vatican and to the ancestral homes of our foundresses, including Assisi, Siena, and Ireland. Some of my fondest memories have been the pilgrimages to Rome. Yes. And as I reflect back on all three pilgrimages, the 1999, the 2002, and the 2005, they were such valuable experiences that enabled us to share with the offices in Rome, what American healthcare was like, and particularly what Catholic healthcare was challenges we were facing in the United States, but was a wonderful opportunity for both the religious and the laypersons on the board to really have a formation experience together and understand uh, the Catholic Church and our connection and our role as sponsor. Mm -hmm. Well, and I also think that when you think about 2002, Two. mm -hmm. we had a less than exciting experience mm -hmm. with the Vatican. Uh, I think we forget that the Vatican is a bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. It really is a bureaucracy. And as much as we're trying to um, pioneer a new paradigm in Catholic health care, the Vatican is trying to figure out mm -hmm. what to do with us. Right. And I think that's part of what went on in 2002 and probably continues still to some extent. In addition to the meetings at the office, what was very rich in terms of the formation of all of us was to return to the origins of the founders yes. of the different congregations. Like the first year, 1999, we went to Assisi and Siena 
followed in the footsteps of Francis and Claire. And then the second year, uh, it was an added privilege for me and a joy to go to Ireland. And we and, do uh, <laughs> Right, and you know, touch back with my mm -hmm. roots, but to really listen at Baggett Street to the mercy tradition. And I think when you said we were less than um, enthused about our response in Rome, but when the men and women heard the story of Catherine Macaulay, the mercies, and then Onega, which you had referenced, the presentations, they felt they weren't the only ones who had to struggle to create a new identity and a new reality That's in right. the church. And it gave us great courage. I would have to say that the visit to Rome, the visit to the Office for Religious, and the pilgrimages to the roots is a very significant, memorable way of forming, reforming ourselves mm -hmm. and our laity. Right. And in the igniting in us, some captivation of that passion and spirit. When we were forming CHI, one of the concerns of the women religious in the various congregations was would their charisms mm -hmm. continue in the ministry? And as you know, charism is a gift given by the Spirit to a particular congregation to fulfill the works of the church. And uh, there have been charisms like the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Charities have been so dear to us all these years. And we invited each congregation to write the story of their foundress mm -hmm. in this book mm -hmm. and also the history of their congregation. I think in addition to the charism book, which does keep alive the legacy of our individual congregations, I see a continuation of a legacy that is being formed in Catholic health initiatives by sacred stories. Mm -hmm. Each volume has rich stories that embrace the, the history and legacy of the religious congregations in one way, express their charisms, but in addition, it certainly is public witness and concrete expression of how the values are being lived out today. And to me, that's a rewarding uh, experience for the religious congregations to know that the work that they have begun is being carried forward as the flame has been passed to a new entity for a new time in history. Yes. And even though we don't acknowledge it so much as a charism, as a culture, to see how they, the Catholic Health Initiatives, really took the charisms and the spirit, and particularly the risk-taking of the foundresses of the 12 congregations and brought it into the 21st century. The work and sacrifice of many dedicated, forward-looking people created a bold new paradigm in Catholic health care. Their energy and selflessness built the foundation for CHI's religious and lay leaders to advance the healing ministry of Christ. Each person is motivated by a spirit of innovation and a commitment to remain faithful to a remarkable legacy of care, now and into the future. When I look at the future, I would hope that those characteristics, a passionate heart for the mission, and the compassionate hand for the care that we provide would always define who we are and how we are to be, whether it's within an institutional setting or within our own neighborhoods. And I share that perspective, Mariana. I would hope that um, CHI's spirit of innovation will always be based on the core values and the legacy of the women religious who started the organization. And that we were faithful to the, our foundresses and their beginning of a healthcare ministry here in the United States and nurturing it into the 21st century and that it would have a future. And I think the fact that we're here today, 10 years later, attests to the fact that we did something that was creative and energizing and vital for the church in the United States. Follow me where I go, what I do and who I know. Make it part of you to be a part of me. Follow me up and down all the way. Take my hand and say you follow me. Follow me where I go, what I do, and who I know. Make it part of you to be. Follow me up and
and down. 